scripture reading for the day comes from the book of Luke, chapter 15. As reading it, I was reminded, God's ways are not my ways. So let's open our ears for those who have ears. Let them hear. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were mumbling and saying, this, this fellow welcomes sinners not to, and to eat with them. So he told a parable. Yeah. 
Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because your brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and he's been found. Amen. Thank you, Elika McGuire, for that beautiful piece. Will you all pray with me as we prepare to hear the words this morning? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I want to briefly send greetings from Pastor Veronica this morning. She is guest preaching at another church in the region. Um, as many of you know, Pastor Veronica is the president of the American Baptist Churches of Metro Chicago, and so she gets to do some, some great guest speaking and preaching around the region, and so our prayers are with her um, as she leads them this morning. Titles. The title we give to a story sets it up for us, right? It frames the narrative. The title of one of my favorite books, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, tells me something. It tells me to be on the lookout for a character named Harry, and that stone is going to come into play at some point. Another one of my favorite books has the title The Sound and the Fury. Yes, I have, I have a diverse literary taste. But The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner, that title symbolizes main themes in the book, especially if you know the Shakespeare soliloquy that the title, Sound and the Fury, is taken from. There's a reason why authors will spend a long time thinking about a title. Often, authors and screenwriters will call their project untitled until they can craft that phrase that entices the reader and captures the significance of the story that they're going to tell. Unfortunately, the well-known title of today's scripture story doesn't really fulfill this role. The parable from Luke chapter 15, as many of us know, and as Tim so wonderfully read this morning, is often called the prodigal son. But I think that that title actually lets the reader down, or at least misleads the audience. Because the prodigal son, as a title, sets us up to focus on just part of the story, on the wayward, disrespectful, frivolous younger brother. But there are actually two other significant characters in the narrative. There's the father and the older brother. Some commentators actually suggest that this parable should be renamed, that it should be called the two brothers or the prodigal son, the waiting father, and the elder brother. For this morning, I've given it a different title. I thought I would borrow from a group of musicians who knew a thing or two about creating a catchy phrase. So this morning, I'm going to call the parable in this sermon, Can't Buy Me Love. This parable is actually the third in a set that Jesus tells in chapter 15 of Luke. It's part of a series of teachings that Jesus lays out for this crowd that has gathered on that particular day. Jesus has gained a large following by this point in the Lucan Gospel. He's often surrounded by people that are often referred to in the text as sinners, those we might think of as outcasts, tax collectors, those who are unfavorable in the eyes of society. They flock to Jesus because he has this radical desire to actually spend time with them. He doesn't turn them away or mock them or judge them. And so understandably, they want to hear what he has to say. But the crowd on this day doesn't just include the outcasts. It also includes members of the social and religious elite. And others who are maybe just curious about his teaching, have kind of heard the rumors and want to check him out. And some of these people, the ones with social clout, they don't really like being around the sinners. 
The text describes them as grumbling. I think we can kind of picture that in our minds. This group that's muttering complaints to one another about how annoying it is that Jesus keeps inviting these low-life do-nothings over for dinner. Jesus has three parables for this diverse crowd, all on the same theme. They're all lost and found parables. First, he tells the parable of the lost sheep, in which a shepherd loses a sheep, goes and finds a lost sheep, and then celebrates. And then there's the parable of the lost coin, in which a woman loses a coin, goes looking for the coin, finds the coin, and then celebrates. With these first two parables, Jesus makes a few clear points. One, that he will always go looking for what is lost. Two, that everyone, every last sheep, every last coin, is equally valuable in God's eyes. And third, that it's always important to throw a party. Might be paraphrasing a little, but in the first two parables, finding what is lost is always followed by celebration. The prodigal son, or can't buy me love, elaborates on these previous parables and themes. But instead of a misplaced sheep or a misplaced coin, this time we hear the story of a lost human. This third parable gives us a vignette of what human lostness looks like. So let's first turn to the most popular character, the one who usually gets the most attention, the prodigal son. The prodigal son decides that while money may not be able to buy him love, it can probably buy him a lot of cool things. So, he decides to ask his father for his inheritance. And in doing so, he's essentially recognizing his father as dead to him. Typically, an inheritance was given after the patriarch had passed away, and so by asking for it early, the younger son is saying that he no longer wants nor has any need for familial connection. And his father obliges him. The prodigal son takes the money and he goes to some far off land. We don't know exactly what he does, but the text says that he spends his money on dissolute living, so we can kind of imagine and fill in the gaps of what he might have gotten into while there. But eventually, as it usually does in these stories, the money runs out. And even worse, a famine comes upon the land that he is living in. So the prodigal son is now broke, starving, working in a literal pigsty. He's lost from his family, his friends, his livelihood. And it's in the midst of this lostness that the prodigal son repents. Repentance. Some of us talked about this during a Bible study on Wednesday. Repentance is a word that can make people a little uncomfortable. I mean, it makes me a little uncomfortable, if I'm honest. It brings back these fire and brimstone sermons that I heard as a young teenager. Sermons that kind of berate the listener for pretty much anything and everything that you've ever done in your entire life. I often hear the word repentance and Think about shame. I actually, earlier in the week, before Bible study, did a Google search to find synonyms, and one of the most popular ones is shame, which isn't really a healthy state to be in. It can often cause these long-lasting emotional wounds. Yet this moment of repentance in the story, it's not about shame. It's not about the things we might usually associate with repentance. The prodigal son demonstrates what I believe is Jesus' definition of repentance. The text says that the prodigal son came to himself. Repentance isn't about feeling ashamed or unworthy. It's about returning to the self. The prodigal son, standing knee-deep in mud, remembers who he is. He's someone who's loved. He's someone with a family. He's someone with connections to other humans who care about him. He's a living human being, and by virtue of that alone, is worthy of food and love and nourishment. So the prodigal son returns to himself, and then he returns home. 
And before he can even get through his rehearsed I'm sorry speech, his dad is lifting him off his feet, celebrating his return. What was lost has been found, and now it's time for a party. The prodigal son lost himself by splitting off from the people who knew him and loved him. He lost himself by pursuing wealth instead of love, but he returns, repents, by coming back to himself as a loved child of God. Of course, the story isn't over at this point. There's the other brother, the elder brother, who, if I'm honest, I relate to a little bit more, I think, any of you are also older siblings, you might recognize yourself in the elder brother. He's done everything by the books. He stuck around, he didn't cut and run, he worked the family business. So when he sees that his little brother is getting a party, he completely loses it. And the father finds the elder brother sitting outside the party tent. Imagine him with his arms crossed and brows furrowed, moping. It reminds me of another biblical story, one of my favorites, the story of Jonah. If you remember, Jonah is tasked with delivering God's word to the people in a city called Nineveh. He's supposed to tell them to repent or face destruction. And after some ups and downs, he eventually gets there and he tells the people to repent. And then he goes up to the top of a mountain and he waits. He's really excited because he thinks the city's going to get destroyed. He's ready for lightning bolts and gods and fury. And nothing happens. Or at least not to Jonah. The city still stands. It turns out the people repent. And Jonah is furious. He can't believe that these people got a second chance. He is beyond irritated that these people returned to themselves, returned to the God who loves them. So similar to Jonah's anger, when the elder brother sees his father, he goes off. He tells his father that he's worked so hard, he's never let the family down, and he's never gotten so much as a goat for a party. He's never gotten a full-on feast. And it's here that we see the second vignette of what it looks like to be lost. The elder brother, while physically there with his family, is emotionally cut off. He, too, has lost himself because he believes that merit equals worth. The elder brother mistakenly thinks that to be worthy in his father's eyes, he has to work for it. He has to earn love in a way to buy his father's love through his own labor. At the end of the parable, his other son has a chance for repentance. The elder brother has a chance to return to himself as beloved simply for being. The father tells this, saying to him, My son, you're always with me. I love you. Everything I have is yours. His father is telling him that he loves him, that he's always loved him, and that his love is not contingent upon productivity. The father invites the son to repent, to come back to himself, to celebrate being alive and part of a community. And we don't know how it ends. We don't get to know the elder son's decision. It's possible that he stays outside moping for the entire evening. It's also possible that he heads inside to the feast, and that he reconciles with his brother, and that both of them remember that they are imperfect, but abundantly loved. This parable shows us there are many ways to become lost. Like the younger brother, we can lose ourselves to the temptation of wealth and material objects. Like the older brother, we can lose ourselves to the idea that we are only as good as the outcomes we produce or the work that we accomplish. We can find ourselves standing in the muck of our own creation thinking, how did I get so far away from me? How did I get so separated from the divine spark inside, from the love that God pours out for me each and every day? These are moments of repentance, moments to return to our core self as loved and flawed and a delight in God's eye. Some of you know that I volunteer as a chaplain at Cook County Jail. So most every other week I help to run a spirituality group for a couple of the 
residential treatment units for women there. And people often ask me why. Why do I do this? And in fact, the women themselves have asked me why I come. And I've kind of struggled to put words to it. I mean, part of it is that I feel that it's my calling as a pastor in Chicago to be there as well. It's part of my city, but that's not totally it. And I don't want to say that I enjoy it, because I don't enjoy seeing people caught up in this oppressive cycle. But there's something about the visits that bring me joy. And this week, as I was thinking about this text, I finally had some words for why. I realized that my visits to the jail are opportunities for my repentance, moments where I can return to myself. They're the most human of interactions. The women call me out if I bring in cheesy poems. They did that last time I was there, saying that actually my poem was bougie, which I'm still not sure exactly what they meant, but I heard it. <laughs> they tell me if I'm distracted, they're brutally honest about their situation how they're feeling, and they're so unbelievably generous. They're always asking me how I'm doing, asking if they can pray for me, telling me that they hope that I have a good week. And there have been days when I've walked in feeling off, feeling scattered, feeling separated from my own essential goodness as a child of God. And these women, they reflect Jesus back. In their faces, in our conversations, I have returned to the undeniable fact that the detainees and I are so precious to God. Not because of anything we have done or haven't done, but just because we are. At the start of the Lenten season on Ash Wednesday, Christian communities around the world celebrate Ash Wednesday by the imposition of ashes. And the pastor will Take ashes and make the sign of the cross on your forehead, saying, From dust you have come, and to dust you shall return. It's a way to remember our mortality, to remember that all of us will have this final great return at the end of our lives. But it's also an invitation to repentance, to the multiple returnings that we do throughout our lives as we come back to our essence. It's a moment to be called back to the one who formed us. When we repent, we turn again to the knowledge, as it says in Romans 8, that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature can separate us from the love of God. We do not have to earn it. We cannot buy it. We are loved beautifully and simply just because we are. We just have to remember it. Amen. Amen.